Welcome to Tech Talk Weekly. I'm Bob from Creation Station. This is our weekly show where we talk about two to three cool tech topics out there in the news, hit you up with some kind of fun library fact and send you on your way in about 20 minutes. As always, if you have any news stories you want us to try and feature this in an upcoming episode, send it to us that week, creationstation at broward.org, and we'll be glad to try and fit them in. Today, we I have a really fun special guest, Cynthia Hayes from the Hollywood Library. How are you doing, Miss Cynthia? Bob, great. How are you? I am doing great. Cynthia and I worked together years ago, and every place she goes has always been a lot of fun to come <laughs> visit her and see. What's been going out there at Hollywood lately? Well, we're just doing uh, the best we can with during the circumstances. We have a lot of displays and we can talk about that a little later if you'd like. Yeah, that would definitely, definitely. We, um, yeah, we've got some really fun stuff happening at all the different branches as everybody's working on things. There's some always some cool stories in the news. Cynthia and I went back and forth with this ahead of time. I was like, no, we can't pick, we can't do all of these. We can only pick a couple of them. So we picked a couple of uh, the interesting stories this week. And the first one I wanted to share out with everybody is something that you may not be thinking about, uh, but just in case, who owns the moon? I know that seems like a pretty counterintuitive thing. Like, no, wait, I thought there's this big treaty that says nobody can own the moon. <laughs> Well, actually, it turns out that that treaty says no country can own the moon. And so this guy, Christopher Lamar, years and years ago, decades ago, set up what he called the Lunar Embassy, where he sold rights to the moon. You could buy like an acre plot on the moon. And I found out about this through this uh, quirky little podcast that I listened to. It was called The Indicator. And what they do is they pick a topic and then they pursue that topic from start to finish. Uh, they've done like buy one barrel of oil or build one T-shirt. Uh, the last project before this one was um, find an old superhero and resurrect a superhero that's not under copyright. So it was kind of an, they do all these quirky things. But the, when they hit space, I was like, okay, I got to talk about this one. Um, who, what do you think, Cynthia? Do you think that individual people should be allowed to just own parts of the moon? I mean, this company claims to do it on all sorts of stuff. I'm not so certain I want it to be anywhere. I don't know. I'm going to have to say no, Bob. I don't I, think so. I, I know. He's got, he, they've got a point. His, I think his company has evolved since his father started it, you know, 40 years ago. And now they've, they've made hundreds of millions of dollars off of people selling pieces of the moon, selling little pieces of paper to people that say you own a piece of the moon. Um, his current thing that he talks about is if there's enough people who claim to own all these little plots, that means no large company, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera, could go buy these things and start doing something on the moon without interfering in your property rights. And so I'm not so certain I buy his argument but please go we'll put the show this will be in the notes afterwards go listen to it. it's a quick nine minute little story about this that's kind of interesting as a as a as a quirky thing and nasa's involved too on their side now it seems okay. like what's going on i don't know i'm not so certain it's a, it's a crazy story then our other story today that I thought was a fun one that was out there was this one on ancient rhinoceroses. What do you think about this there, Miss Cynthia? Well, um, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, are they endangered still? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, that was one of the things I discovered. I didn't know how many different um, species of rhino there were out there before reading this article. All the, hundreds of, of different species of, of rhinoceroses over the years that have all died out to bring us down to the eight existing ones that we have. I had no idea. And it's all because of their genetics, all because of how their DNA works. And it's a very uh, non-diverse group. 
And so from back at, uh, you know, in between 50 to 60 million years ago is when they first start that whole rhinoceros line starts off on the evolutionary tree, but then almost all of them go extinct two and a half million years, 2.5 million years ago, except for these eight that we still kept around. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so yes. part of this kind of leads me to the idea of where's conservation plays a role versus or how our conservation works. You know, is it in conservation of the actual animals or is it conservation of their land kind of thing, habitat? Um, because partially this, it was it made me feel a little bit better, a little bit bad about was it looks like they were, they're on their way to dying out no matter what we can do, which kind of stinks. I was going to say, yes, are we sure they're dying, slowly dying or are we doing something? Oh, it's definitely us doing it. It's definitely humans messing up things. Yeah. I don't think there's any, any pretty, but it would argue that one. But it was just kind of weird to read this and, and about how it works. And then the little kicker buried in this that I okay. thought was, let me see if I can find a quote in here again. Um, it is from uh, one of the only species out there that has lesser um, DNA uh, differential is cats. Because cats actually have a smaller variation in their DNA from your typical house cat all the way up to tigers than rhinos do across all their multiple species. And I was like, wait a minute, maybe this is part of the reason why, again, habitat destruction, etc., that humans are doing but maybe this is another reason why big cats are not, you know, I'd, I'd like to find that study and, and see where they, where they go on that. Yeah. Or are we just messing up the planet too much, Cynthia? We're messing up the planet too much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I yeah. think so. I know. I think so. I think so. Yeah, they're they're talking about you know in very specific areas, uh, the Sumatran you know rhinoceroses are being destroyed by their habitat and and all the illegal poaching for um, African ones. We actually talked about this about five or six months ago. They have a new thing where they're injecting dye into the rhino horns to make them useless in trade. Oh, so that they're no good. Yeah, on some of the uh, African rhinos, oh, so okay. that. It, if you go find them, it, it turns the horns bright pink. Okay. So you can't use it in the met, in the traditional medicines that they want, and they're very bright and obvious that which rhinos, and now you know they're tagged, and you know the, all the stuff to keep the poachers away. It's kind of a weird thing. I I, know, I never thought, wow, all this stuff about rhinoceroses, and I start digging into this article, and I start finding more and more and more. It's really interesting stuff. But... You know, these are the kind of things I could just be talking about these all day. I can hang out with you and do this. Um, we did have another story, though, that probably is going to take a little bit more time to explain. So, you know what Unicode is, Cynthia? Did you know before this article? No, to be honest, no. Okay. So Unicode, and by the way, we'll include the website for that organization. Uh, here is their uh, overall website here to do it. Unicode is the actual code, um, hexadecimal code for your keyboard to be able to type out any kind of language, any kind of symbols that are out there. So everybody uses this already because you're, you've used e emojis, and so like just a little smiley emoji, you know, the, the colon and the end parentheses, that combined creates a different Unicode to put up the little smiley face. And that's how you get things across all sorts of different platforms. Well, Unicode, Unicode also was there for all of our letters, all of our numbers. And that's what this story was all about from India this week. About... Tulu, 
um, which is also Tagalog. So, uh, I knew I was going to mess it up. <laughs> Tagalog, Tagalari is, I think, I, that's how I remember it being pronounced for me. I had the little computer pronounce it for me. Um, of how to set this up for a language that is disappearing. And there's a lot of those languages out there that are that way, that are, you know, all these ones that either, there's a handful that don't even have a written script, but so many of them are disappearing because we just don't have people who speak them on a regular basis anymore. You know, here in the United States, Native Americans have several languages like that. In India, it's the same way. Um, Africa of course. Too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Africa has several of them that are out there that, that and Africa is another spot where they really have some that aren't even written at all. They're only um, passed along through an oral tradition. I, I thought one of the quirks here was it's spoken by very few people, 1.8 million. Whereas here in the United States, some of the Native American languages are much um, narrower than that even. Yeah. What do you, so where, basically, where do you, tell me, Cynthia. So, uh, basically, what do you think that we could possibly do or they can do to try to keep these somewhere like in some form of a, like a collection place to keep these? Could they do something in terms of trying to uh, preserve these type of different languages through something like a blockchain of some sort, you know? That's an interesting idea because um, one way that we currently try and keep these these uh, languages alive is just doing uh, recordings and doing the transcriptions and the recordings. But then to do the transcription, you need the actual alphabet that they're done in. And so some of them, and like this one here, the Tulu script where it's made up of different symbols. And when you combine two symbols, it creates a third new word or a third new way of speaking it. Um, so it's a lot more complicated. You could, couldn't just put it on a keyboard, very much like trying to type in Mandarin, uh, yes. you know, those kinds of keyboards out there. But yeah, how could we do this? And and like you mentioned blockchain there, because blockchain is a great way of keeping something locked in to stop it from changing or at least recording all the changes, which is exactly what they talk about here in the article, where this is a language that is written in one way, but spoken in another way and spoken by different people over the years and how the oral language may change, and they tried to come two competing groups trying to encode this and how the different sounds should be encoded different ways. Um, blockchain might actually be a way of doing that. If you could find a way of recording it on the blockchain, then you would know when things changed, when people did that. Um, but you would still need some way of being able to include that recording or that thing. Maybe you found a, a good use for NFTs to make an NFT for uh, audio recordings of uh, languages. And that way you have a guarantee that you've got to think this is the original as a guarantee kind of thing. Yeah. Right. That's a nice idea, Cynthia. I like that. Combining those things and and this is uh, uh let me see I don't think they have the picture here of it it was in a different story sorry but there is uh, these are all written on palm leaves the original original stuff that one of the people is oh yes they do here it is on yeah. um, these leaves of the palm isn't that neat that, yeah and it's just so neat mm -hmm. um and so these pictures of the, that these are just like stacked. <laughs> And then this is how they kept their records or books. Instead of using scrolls or clay tablets, this is what they wrote them on. Yep. And yep. how could you track that sort of thing? You may have hit upon an idea that they didn't even talk about on here, Cynthia. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being able to figure out how to do that. And, and again, one of the reasons I thought this was a fun topic to talk about is to, A, bring it to people's attention how 
people work on these back, the background side of what we all do on the internet um, and communicating with each other. But also, it took, it's taken years and they're still not done. And it's not even a question of year of of years of work of creating the actual thing. Of it's the years of getting people to agree which is the correct symbol to use for which piece, and how to encode all those. It's true. Yeah. It definitely, it's definitely takes true. a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah. this quote here was the the one. Coming up along with your lines about vanishing languages from Africa or North America in particular, whenever you have an oral language, once you start trying to make it a written language, that's a whole new way of thinking about things and changing. And and maybe is that yes. Western thinking coming into somebody else and saying, no, you have to have a written language. You can't just do an oral language. Mm -hmm it's translating from one to the other it could get mixed communication yeah yeah it is it's it really is. a different thing of how that works and where do you where do you draw the line to keep old traditions alive meld them into this new tech landscape so that they don't get forgotten and still honor their old traditions it's it's a really it's, for anybody who's out there is listening. Please go follow the links. Go read this article. It's a, it's a little bit of a lengthy article, but it's really interesting in how they talk about because this language that they're doing is one of the original ways Sanskrit was written. <laughs> when Sanskrit spread to India, or what would become the, the Indian subcontinent, this is one of the original languages. So this is something that's been multiple thousands of years in existence and we're just now trying to save it rescue it make sure before we it all vanishes and that's correct yes very interesting article yeah interesting. good pick thanks. thanks but i really yeah i was really just blown away by part of this because i knew what unicode was because of all the emoji stuff and i see you know better representation in the emojis that have been coming out in the last couple of years um, but then all the background stuff to this was just like, just wow. Um, but and anyone who's interested in really digging deep into it, it's just unicode.org and they have all sorts of stuff to do. Technically, you could join the Unicode organization if you wanted to, to help influence this. Um, I looked and it's like, 20,000 plus per year to join their organization to make these decisions. So it's not something the average person's going to be doing. No. But you can see but here can on see the page, uh, if you just want to do the double quotes, it's the U plus 201D. Or if you want to do a little wizard, it's the U plus 1F9D9 because it's hexadecimal. So it's it's 16 digits represented with um, numbers and letters. Okay. Thank you very much for being here, Miss Cynthia. Tell me what's going on out there at Hollywood. What kind of stuff? You, you gave us a teaser before. What kind of things are you working on out there? Well, one of our librarians has a display with the immersive virtual books, reality books that are really oh yeah not shelf and the kids really really love them so that's one of the things that's going on i don't know if we have any of them on the shelf left here at, my, at maine they keep getting checked out every day they do they do so i think that's a, a very very interesting since you know school has started back mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah very very interesting and a lot of um adults are now you know coming in as well and they are getting interested because we have a lot of adult uh learners and going back yeah. to school yeah so yeah, so that's one of the things I really thought that the display that the librarian uh, put up was really interesting. As a matter of fact, I checked out one of the books myself. Which one did you get? I got the one with the earth. Oh, cool. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I, I've done that. I, and that and our merge cubes where we, I just redid that for uh, an event 
um, there was an outdoor event we gave some merch cubes out at um, to do the earth and, and looking at the climate stuff and all those things and the solar system on the merge cubes. That's it there. So, and uh, again, everybody, you can check any of these out free at your library. Your library card is free. Checking them out is free. You can still come in, pick them up. If you don't feel comfortable coming into a building yet, we do curbside still, all the stuff like that. Yeah. And we do all the online programming like this to get you access and get you ideas of what you want to go out and play with and try. That's correct. Yep, we have it all pretty much. Hollywood's a six day a week library now. It is. So it we is. just yeah, because I know we uh, a bunch of libraries just went to six days. Um, yep. Not everybody's out there yet, but contact your local library for that kind of information. We need to do this more often. This just this is like not enough time for us here. We just like flew right on by. Man, oh man. We could spend, Cynthia and I used to spend hours together talking about all sorts of computer stuff and all sorts of things. We were out there in the world when she worked with me in a computer center at African American. It was great. It was. We will try to get there and do that again. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in this week. Again, if you have any, if you have a favorite library or favorite library and you want to see featured, creation station at Broward.org. And we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Tom. Have a great day. Appreciate it. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.